University's Kennedy School of Government. He teaches operations management, policy development field lab, lobbying, theory practice and simulations, and supply chain management in the degree programs. In executive education programs, he teaches about infrastructure, strategy, and cross-boundary collaboration. He is presently spearheading an HKS initiative examining the policy and associated regulatory impacts of autonomous vehicles. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today, Mark. Over to you. Well, thank you very much. And to all the participants who are joining, thank you for investing an hour of your time in supply chain management. Six months ago, if I told some friends that I was doing a seminar on supply chain management, they would have politely said, oh, that's nice, and that would have been it. Yesterday, when I told some friends that I was doing a session, they said, oh, what's it about? Can I join? We have gone from those of us in the supply chain world from a backwater to really being front and center. Everyone knows about supply chains. To give you some examples uh, that it is clearly in the public eye, Here's an example from a Forbes article not long ago, how COVID-19 supply chain issues are impacting retailers. And by the way, uh, the retail sales numbers just came out for last month. Clothing dropped 70%. Wow. Another example uh, from the New York Times talks about food supply. Yet another example here from The Economist talks about the impacts on China. And the last one is probably the most intriguing because it's perhaps the most unusual. It comes from Psychology Today, and it says, should you prep your supply chain as a personal individual to reduce your stress and concerns? So clearly, this is a hot topic. And the, the heat of the topic can be visualized very easily with the impacts of the shortages that have become commonplace as a result of failures in our supply chain. I suspect many of you have encountered grocery store shelves that look like this. Initially, it was in the uh, sanitizer section, and then it migrated to the toilet paper section, and then it migrated to the food section. But this has become a very common phenomenon that we've all been dealing with. In thinking about this session, there are really three objectives I have and hopefully will provide value to you in the course of, of this hour. The first is I want to provide you with an overview of what is supply chain management. Uh, the words are very common now, uh, but I want to make sure we all have a grounding in what the actual definition is, some of the key principles, and some examples of how they're built. The second is I want to share uh, with you some failures, but also some successes uh, in supply chain management, so we can start to construct for ourselves a set of supply chain management best practices. And third, and perhaps most important, is I want to think about how we can apply the insights we develop to make your world more effective. And it may be your world as a professional, but it also may be your world as in your personal life. Because as it turns out, we've learned we are all supply chain managers. To get us started, I thought we should begin with a definition. I'm big on definitions, and so as a starting point. So let me read this to you, and as I read it, I have a request. Listen for the key words in this that really resonate to you. They speak to you and they say something important, because I'm going to ask you to raise your hand and share one or two of the words that really make an impact in you and why, so that we can really pull out of this definition what's really important. So let me read it to you. The management of the flow of goods and services and includes all the processes that transform raw materials into a final product to maximize customer value and to gain a competitive advantage in the marketplace. Now, the last part of that is competitive 
uh, advantage of the marketplace. The definition comes from Investopedia, so it's not terribly surprising. It's got that private sector orientation. But I could drop out that last piece and talk about public value for those of you who are in the public sector. So um, if you wouldn't mind, um, let's get one of our hand raisers to unmute and uh, share what resonated for them in this definition. Elka, you're on. Go right ahead. Gotta unmute. It's one of the challenges. I'm to unmute you, Elka. I think you're good. good now. Go. Elka, can you? Tell you what, let's go to someone else and All we'll right, let's Elka try someone through. else. Lorindo. Hi. Uh, good evening, everyone. Hi. Uh, yeah. For, for me, the, the two words that can, can be highlighted uh, in this definition is the maximize customer value. Excellent. Absolutely. When we think about a supply chain, we're thinking about the end consumer of this product or service. It's got to create value for them. Excellent. Let's get someone else in who has a different view or a different word they want to share. Uh, Gasman? Can you hear me? I'm going to try this again. Oh. Yes. Uh, I think that uh, a term that fits is perfect order fulfillment from the customer's perspective. Yep. Very good. Excellent. All right, so I know a lot of you have your hands raised. It's a big group, so I can't get to everyone. But whenever you think about a definition like this, unpack it a little bit and think about what the keywords are. For me, a couple of additional keywords. I love the word flow because it's implying that there's a movement, a shift in the transformation of how we actually deliver to this customer. The other piece that's important to me is the two words, all processes. It's the entirety of what we're grappling with because one of the things we've really learned about supply chains in COVID-19 that most of us who are in this business knew before is that any one link in the chain that breaks, the whole thing fails. So that's our definition. So we'll use that as we kind of march forward on this. In terms of understanding supply chains, there are a couple of foundational concepts I just want to share. The first is that in any supply chain, there are multiple organizations involved. It could be inside your own organization with different divisions, but most commonly when we talk about supply chains, we're really referring to the multiple organizations who have to come together to weave together the chain so it works. Now that's not surprising. The problem is, if you think about it, each of those organizations spends the vast majority of their time thinking inside their own four walls thinking about what makes them successful, less time thinking about what makes your upstream or downstream suppliers successful. Therefore, for a supply chain management system to work effectively, you have to manage it as a single integrated unit. Failure anywhere is failure to the all. Second, you need to manage physical flows. That's the physical flows of stuff, products. But equally important, you need to manage information flows. Because what enables you to operate as an integrated unit is sharing information up and down the supply chain. 
in my degree course on operations management and also on my supply chain course, we do a beer simulation. It's a beer distribution simulation, and it's four stages. So we have a factory, a distributor, a wholesaler, and a retailer, and then an end consumer. And they are unable to communicate other than passing orders back and forth to each other. It is astonishing how quickly people get frustrated and how bad the decision making comes very quickly when you can't share information. When I do the exact same simulation, but I let each of the four players sit around the computer and make joint decisions, it's a whole lot better. That's the core of supply chains. You manage the physical flows, and you manage the information flows. So what does it take to be successful? What, what does it take for a supply chain to operate? I thought there'd be no better way to start than uh, some of us are at least having our morning coffee. I realize some of you are, are having perhaps a, a late night beverage, but let's start with coffee. When you think about the supply chain for coffee, the starting point is obviously you gotta source the beans. Someone's growing those beans somewhere. From there, we need to collect them and transport them. We need, in other words, we're aggregating them together. From there, we probably will store them and ultimately transport them in larger volumes to a port, put them on a ship, especially if they're coming, say, to the US or Europe or Asia. Uh, we'll warehouse them again. We'll then eventually get them distributed out uh, and so that they can be processed and then ultimately we will brew them and have that wonderful cup of coffee. The key to supply chain management is not looking at these the way I just clicked through them. One step, another step, another, another, another. It's looking at them as a single integrated connected unit of nodes and links. The nodes are places, like the place where you grow the coffee, the links are transportation to get to and from the different players. When we think about any supply chain, there are four core building blocks that make up those chains. It all starts with sourcing. So in this particular case, I have an example uh, from the clothing world. Uh, this is uh, some sewing uh, taking place in Bangladesh. And here, when you think about sourcing, there are some key criteria you wanna have in mind. Obviously, one is price, but another has to be quality because it doesn't mean any good if I have a lot of goods produced and they're defective. And that's true whether it's clothing or electronics or literally food, anything. But sourcing starts our supply chain. From there, we build on to transportation. In transportation, we know that there are a variety of different modes of transportation. There's trucks, there's trains, there's boats, there's planes. Each one of those has a unique set of characteristics that are price and quality and speed. And we need to think about for this particular supply chain, what is the best way of bringing that product to where it's headed next? The third big building block is warehousing. Uh, the images I wanted to share with you here represent the range, the spectrum of types of warehousing we see out in the world today. It can be from literally as manual as just carrying large sacks on your back to the bottom image, which is a robot that does picking, packing, and shipping uh, with no human involvement. The last piece, and perhaps the most important, is inventory management. So here, the core concept of inventory management is a scale. And on that scale, you've got two things. On the left, you see stockouts. The reason we hold inventory is to make sure that that doesn't happen. 
But equally, I don't want to hold so much that I'm on the right hand side of the scale and I got my hand on my head saying, what am I going to do with all this unused product? Inventory management is the balancing of those two issues. We weave together these four building blocks to create the actual chain. So here is an example of taking nodes and links. Uh, this one happens to be uh, getting a lot of press right now, at least here in the US. Uh, this is about food. Uh, and you can see you have the farm leading to a processor, leading to transportation, leading to the grocery shelf, and leading to ultimately the consumer. What I like about this image is two things. One is it shows very simply what we're talking about with supply chains. And I don't think there's anything, you, you know, kind of revolutionary there. But look at the bottom of it. The bottom of it has the information flow because we all think about the physical product moving through the supply chain. We equally need to think about the information flow that enables that chain to be effective. In addition to a more typical example like this, I wanted to share with you other types of supply chains that exist. Electricity is one of my favorites because I think a lot of people don't spend a lot of time thinking about electricity and certainly not as a supply chain, but it is actually very much a supply chain where you have producers, so in this particular case a wind turbine, you have the transportation, which in this case is provided by a transmission line with the electrons passing through it, and ultimately the distribution to you, your home, and running perhaps your computer so that you can watch this. These are pretty typical supply chains. And again, I suspect this is what you would anticipate us talking about. Now, here is where it gets a little more interesting. Describing a supply chain is not hard. But the question becomes, what is actually success? Well, I think there are three things that define success for a supply chain. One is it provides quality. The second is provides efficiency. And I suspect everyone's saying, yeah, of course that's true. I think number three is really where it gets interesting which is the, what I refer to as the genius of the and. It isn't just quality or just efficiency. You have to provide both simultaneously, and that ain't so easy. Now, let's start with quality, because I think uh, when we talked about the definition, uh, the two people who got to speak talked about customer, talked about expectations. Well, the dominant expectation from a customer's perspective is quality. Here's my question to you, so get ready for your hand raising. How do you define quality? In the context specifically of supply chains, what are the attributes that define quality? So let me pause here. Let's get a couple of people to raise your hands and then uh, I'll let the executive team uh, unmute, unmute you and let's hear what you have to say. And we'll just try and rifle through maybe uh, three or four people just so we can get some little bit broader perspective. Great. Sean McGruder, I am unmuting you. Undamaged and uh, accomplishes the, or, I said undamaged and within the specifications uh, that are expected. Aha, uh -huh. so no, can I reverse those for you for a second? Okay. Let's think about them as specifications. I have a specific requirement I'm trying to define. I want it to meet those, and oh, by the way, it doesn't do me any good if when it left the factory it met those, if in transportation it got damaged, or in warehousing it got damaged. Terrific, thank you, Sean. And those are also key components of what we refer to as total quality management, how we think about quality. Excellent. Let's get on to someone else, please. Okay. 
Jonathan Drew, I'm unmuting you. Hi, I think something that works well and is great value for money. Ah, works well. Okay, we, ha we absolutely agree with that. I, take one second and just give us your layman's interpretation of value for money. It's a buzzword, lots of people use, I just want to kind of dumb well, it down for me. Yeah, so, so for me, the value is in the, um, the way in which something works, that it's not, as, as your last speaker was saying, not damaged and looks, you know, it depends what it is, whether it's something that tastes good or looks good um, or is efficient if it's something, say, in the kitchen. Um, uh, and it, I feel I haven't been fleeced um, for it, that I'm, I've got a good bargain. Okay, good. Very good. Let's get, let's get another uh, observation here. Uh, Michael Lynn. Hello. Um, I was going to answer kind of the opposite. I feel that if the supply chain is damaged, quality uh, infers the ability to be resilient and to recover in the event that things don't go correctly. Very interesting. I got to ask you to hang on to that observation for about three slides because you're exactly right. That is one of the things we've learned over the years and certainly with COVID-19 about what makes for a robust and successful supply chain. So thank you. Excellent. We'll come back to that. Let's get one more here. Roger, sorry, Raja Shakar. Yeah, hi, uh, Professor Mark, and uh, thank you, Erika, for facilitating this. Uh, I work with the pharmaceutical industry, Mark, so um, because we are all in this unprecedented COVID situation, uh, let me take this example of uh, we have got some uh, testing kits from China, and uh, as we have performed those testing here in India, they haven't been consistent. So if I use the word consistency, so in this particular uh, difficult times, uh, as a you know hospital doctor or whatever, I would expect uh, some level of consistency in the product I have uh, ordered for. So uh, that's a serious concern. If the same quality uh, that has been shipped in a X country is not uh, is found to be inconsistent when I import it, that's a serious cause for concern. So I would expect the same kind of quality when the product is shipped from a country to uh, the destination country. So I hope uh, I'm clear. Terrific, you are, and that's a, a, an excellent observation. In particular, it gives me, uh, it, it triggered in my mind a very interesting uh, paper that was written by a researcher named Zithamal. Uh, she looked at how people define quality. It wasn't just in the context of supply chains, it was more broadly. And what she discovers is the number one thing people identify is reliability. And reliability is kind of a, a bit of an umbrella because it captures what you just described about consistency. It captures what our first observer talked about in terms of specifications. Uh, and it also has an element of, of our, uh, our commentator who talked about you know, resilience, it's got that ability to kind of deal with the, the bumps in the road that are likely to come. So from this, I hope what you're gathering is that when we talk about supply chain from a quality perspective, it's you get what you expected, when you expected, in the form you expected it to come in. And so that is our quality piece. And in terms of efficiency, if we look at this as and kind of do the same process, here I think most people would talk about cost. And I would too. It is, you know, what is the cost to produce X? Now, cost is a funny word. I'm going to think about cost in, a, in the context of total life cycle costs. So it may be, uh, and it drives back to our friend who talked about value for money. There's not value for money if I get it and it ain't any good. But from an efficiency perspective in a supply chain, what I'm really looking at is I'm thinking about how do I minimize my costs while I meet that quality requirement? And it is not just 
minim minimizing costs in sourcing, but it is minimizing costs across the entire supply chain, the sourcing, the transport, the warehousing, the inventory. There's been a lot of discussion as a result of COVID on uh, efficiency concerns, because one of the way we've gotten really efficient in supply chains is we have really tightened inventory management. So those of you who are in the production world are probably familiar with just-in-time production systems. Uh, you may be familiar with concepts of lean. All of these are around how do I take excess out of the system and really get it just in time? Just as I'm needing that next box of cereal, magically that box arrives. I don't have 10 in the cupboard or I don't run out. Doing this requires a lot of sharing of information and a lot of reliability or quality in each of these players. To me, what you're really looking for in any supply chain is finding the optimization of both quality and efficiency. There are times when I may, in order to get that reliability we spoke of earlier, in order to get that reliability, I may need to be willing to have a little bit higher costs. I may need to be willing to have a little more inventory. I may be willing to have a little bit more fast or reliable transportation system to get me there. That's what we're going after. If we move from there, I want to highlight that a lot of focus on supply chains right now have been on physical products in the private sector. Personal protective equipment as an example, certainly. Uh, in the US right now, there's a pork shortage. That's an issue. But I also want to highlight, and this is probably my orientation being at the Kennedy School, is that the public sector supply chains are just as important and just as challenging. And whether it's potable water up in the top left or generating license plates and registrations, vaccines, dealing with wastewater, or even just providing lunch, lunches at schools, we all manage supply chains. So this is something that isn't just for Apple or for the limited, this is all of us. Now, when supply chains work, they're largely invisible. So why do I have this image of currency? It is because I think one of the most amazing supply chains is for physical currency. Think about it. When was the last time you wanted money and you couldn't get it? It wasn't available. Think about the last time you gave that money to a, a merchant and they gave you change back. This is one of the most complex supply chains there is. It has all the sectors, right? It's got the public sector because you've got the Federal Reserve banks or the central banks in your country. They are designing it. They're acquiring it, either making it themselves or buying it. They are distributing it. And then you've got this whole additional sector of banks who are essentially the intermediaries to help move it through the system. And then you've got literally tens of thousands of merchants. And then you've got millions of us with currency. And yet it works. And not only does it have to get out there, it has to minimize the opportunities for counterfeiting, and it also has to be able to reverse the logistics and get old bills out of circulation and destroyed. 
It's an amazing supply chain. And as I say, when they work well, we don't even know about it, don't even think about it. However, they don't all work well. And when it fails to work, it's a disaster. And that's what we have right now with COVID-19. The personal protective uh, devices are a real problem for us. And it's true, I think, across the globe. It, it's certainly true, very much I'm seeing it here in Boston. Turns out uh, Boston and Massachusetts has been very much a hot spot uh, for COVID. We see it here, but it's everywhere. And so our job is to try and figure out how do we not let these kinds of disasters take place. Now, COVID-19 is clearly in all of our minds uh, all the time. The fact that we're doing this online instead of perhaps having you in a classroom uh, is proof positive of it. But we have seen supply chain challenges over the years and have actually figured out a lot of important insights or best practices in thinking about how we respond to them. So I've got three challenges that we've seen in supply chains. On the top right, we have a strike. And strikes are not uncommon. They happen a lot. Uh, unlike COVID-19, they're not global. They're not a pandemic. They tend to be more localized. But they can dramatically interrupt your ability to produce your final product. Another example are natural disasters. And we have those, again, all the time. The image I put up for you here uh, is New Orleans, Louisiana. This is after the flooding took place uh, subsequent to Hurricane Katrina in 2005. And what you're looking at is an image of a city that is flooded. Uh, it, to give you a sense of size and scale, from where you're sitting kind of looking at this, if you were looking 15 kilometers straight ahead and 15 kilometers to the side, that is the amount of the city that is completely inundated with water. So if you think you got problems with supply chains, think about the supply chain here. Not only do you have people who you need to rescue, not only is it 42 degrees Celsius outside and 100% humidity, so you need water and ice and there's no electricity, there's no communications. This is a huge, huge supply chain challenge. So <clears throat> we also have certainly seen it with hurricanes. Um, I know right now uh, there's a cyclone bearing down on uh, India and Bangladesh, which is again, raising additional challenges that you've got kind of COVID and on top of that, this new cyclone. All of these are not new to us. We also have seen in the past couple of years, a new, more political oriented challenge and that's trade wars. There have always been trade skirmishes, but for the past what, year, two years, three years, it's really intensified. And so as we've seen tariffs jump up on products, you've seen people scrambling. How can I meet my efficiency goals in this world where all of a sudden products that were costing a dollar now all of a sudden cost a dollar 35. So the challenges aren't new. And what I want to drive us to is thinking about, well, what have we done in response to these? What best practices have we developed? And there are five I wanna highlight. I'll list them and then we'll go through each one in a little more detail. The first is the importance of diversification of supply chains. Uh, we're all told that from a personal financial perspective, we should think about diversifying our asset base uh, so you don't have all your money in cash or in stocks or in property. The same is true with supply chains. Maybe some global, maybe some local, maybe different suppliers. We'll talk a little more about that. 
So one is diversification. A second is a concept called backward mapping. A third is prioritization in addressing risks. The fourth is what our colleague about 10 minutes ago said about finding how you can be more resilient. And then finally, it's finding and fixing the weak link and doing that all the time. So let me take you through what I mean by each of these. So the, the great adage is don't put all your eggs in one basket because if you trip and fall, all the eggs get smashed. So the idea here is diversifying your supply chain. And the two key dimensions we tend to focus on are suppliers, that you don't have only one supplier of a key component. It makes no sense to have one supplier because what happens if there is a work stoppage? What happens if they have a quality problem? And we've seen these happen. So think about this. Yes, you may well be giving a little bit uh, away in terms of efficiency, because perhaps if you consolidated all your volume on one supplier, you could get a little bit better price. But what is the true risk and cost to that? may not be worth it. So think about having some diversified suppliers. What we're also seeing the importance of is diversified geography. Having some, all of your supply chain be six to 9,000 miles away, we've now seen with COVID, but we saw it before. We've seen it with explosions at ports. We've seen it in natural disasters, very long, distant supply chains may be very cost effective, but may raise those quality concerns. Remember my genius of the end. I'm trying to balance my efficiency with my quality and get both. I do that with diversification. A second strategy is called backward mapping. And the best way I can image for you what I'm talking about are the nested dolls. So, Nested dolls are you open one up and there's another one just like it inside and you take it out and you open it up and you can see them coming down the line. Supply chains are just like this. Think of the supply chain for any product. So I happen to be looking at a cereal box. So the supply chain for that cereal box, uh, well, it clearly has the grain and the sugar and the cardboard to make the box and there was transportation and all that. And when you think about as a consumer, the supply chain to get that box, that's what you think about. But wait a minute, to create the cardboard, there was a sub supply chain inside that. Now, this is a relatively trivial example, but if I go to PPE, personal protective uh, equipment, and I think about masks, well, it turns out that not only do you have to have, think about the supply chain for the manufacturer of that, you need to think about upstream for them what is required in order to produce the materials that produce the masks. Now this is where the nested doll concept comes in. I may well, think about, well, if I'm the supplier uh, uh, and I'm looking at the supply chain for those masks, I need to worry not only about can the producer produce, but what about the chemicals that are needed to produce that? But equally, you can go back one level. Well, for that chemical producer, what did they need? And so there's a formal methodology that's really kind of being played out now where you not only look at the supply chain that you're directly a part of, but you look backward or upstream to understand what else can inhibit the ability of you to get your equipment. So backward mapping, an important methodology to understand what's going on. A third is to prioritize and address risks. If any of you are in the food sector, you may be familiar with the concept of HACCP. It stands for hazard, I'll read it, hazard analysis critical control points. And it's introduced uh, now globally, 
uh, in, in food supply chains. And the idea is in every supply chain, there are certain risks. With food, it typically has to do with temperature because if it gets too hot, then it may get certain bacteria or viruses associated with it. Uh, it gets too cold, it may get burned. So you want to identify in your supply chain where on the 20 places that it could be a problem, where is it really a focal point problem and zero in on solving those. Those are the critical control points and you want to really monitor and measure them. Even if you're not in the food sector, if you're interested in thinking about risk identification, prioritization, and management, take a look at the concept of HACCP. Look it up on the web, you'll find a ton of stuff on it. It's really interesting. A third issue comes to our colleague who talked about resilience. Uh, this is a chart that I like a lot, and I'm going to try and use my cursor so you can kind of follow what I'm going to show you. The, the idea here is that we have along our hor horizontal axis time, and we have the measurement of how bad things are. So here's the event, and there are multiple different potential paths. So the worst path is the event takes place, you have uh, a, a dr dramatic reduction in the, the performance, and it just stays there. It just kind of collapses. A more, much more common is that you have an event, it drops down, but then you have a recovery, although it is a slow recovery. Our job in thinking about resilience in supply chains is how do I minimize how deep I go? How do I minimize how long it takes to get back? And when I get back, how do I actually put myself in a position where I'm in a better position than I was before it even began? The idea is don't build a system that just replicates what we had. When I rebuild a system because there was an event, I want it to be better, stronger, more resilient. We see a lot of this in terms of a response to uh, natural disasters, it isn't easy to do because in the moment, you just want to get stood back up again. You want to get your electricity back and your water back and people housed. But if you actually invest a little bit of time, money and energy in forward thinking, you can get to this idea of an adaptive solution which will minimize the chances of having a supply chain interruption the next time round. The final of these best practices is the idea of finding and fixing the weak link. The image I've shown you here is absolutely fascinating. It looks at Ford Motor Company and it shows the number of suppliers that if that supplier is unable to provide their components to Ford, Ford cannot produce cars. There are 200 suppliers that if they have an interruption of more than a day or two, Ford can't produce a car. This is unbelievable. I mean, think about it. Now, to be fair, they have thousands and thousands and thousands of suppliers. And the vast majority of them, that's not true. But for those couple of hundred, it's a big deal. So here's my question to you. And again, I'll ask for you to, to raise your hands and we'll call on a couple of people. Were you in Ford's shoes? What actions, what strategies, what approaches would you take in order to ensure for those top 200 suppliers that you are not in a vulnerable position, that you don't have to stop your production. So let's get a couple of hands raised and uh, go ahead and 
uh, unmute someone and let's hear what you have to say. Uh, Isabel, you are unmuted. Am I unmute now? You are I'm good muted. to go. We can hear you. Good. Thanks a lot. And thank you, Mark and, and Erica, for this very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, I would suggest that um, um, Ford should diversify its suppliers and, uh, as you said, ensure that um, it has fallback solutions. So, in the, with the Russian dolls, ensure that when they cannot use even the bigger doll, they would use the one which is a bit smaller, but which uh, uh, could still provide the service. Okay, the very good. Thank you. All right, let's get someone else in. What are you going to do? Ken Carlstedt. Go right ahead. Ken? Okay. We'll try someone else. Someone else. Oh. There you are, Ken. Yeah, very good. Thank you very much for this clear and informative webinar. I think that we're discussing an element, or we're almost not discussing a very large element that has become prominent lately, which is the government element, uh, which we would normally call regulatory, but now it has become a customer or an overseer uh, during the COVID of, uh, of every node and every link and we have to deal with that because of the requirements and the slowdowns that the government has put on industry and factories and transportation service providers so what i would do with ford is emphasize very quickly communications with these suppliers to find out how the local regional state federal government um, impositions are affecting them and even try to partner with them to assist if possible uh, but get good communication from the ground from that regulatory perspective that has become a, a major uh, disruptor to every supply chain globally. Very interesting, good. I mean I want to really zero in on that communications piece because that is really essential whether it's business to business relationship or business to government relationship, the communications is key. Good, let's get one more observation in. What else would you do? Shawana Jackson, Johnson, sorry. Uh, following on to that communications comment, I would take a really good look at my lease owners right now that might have within the next six months an option to turn their car in and in order to delay that response, I would put a marketing program together to put it in their best interest to keep their lease going. Interesting, very good, thank you. So you can see, just amongst our three comments, a variety of different ideas coming together. Again, we're always trying to find the weak link, we're trying to fix it, but it's persistent. As soon as you fix one, the weakest link, there's a new weakest link, and you got to go solve that. Now, the, the comment before about kind of the COVID world that your colleague just made really kind of comes to the fore when we think about COVID-19, because the challenges here are truly unprecedented. It's global. It's affecting every sector. I mean, it's just inconceivable, quite frankly. But let's zero in from the consumer's perspective. So, you know, as a, as a consumer of, I got toilet paper, I got PPE, I got right now pork. These are all places where we're seeing challenges from the kind of the consumer's lens. What's causing those challenges? When you think about understanding challenges, there's a concept called root cause analysis. And it says, what I want to get to is what's really at the root of it? What's at the heart of it? Because if I understand the root and I can solve the root, then I can really make progress. And there's a methodology called the four Ps. And it's policy, process, plant, physical plant, and people. And you kind of march through each one of those and think about 
how are they contributing to this challenge? So when you look at the issues we've seen right now, and I apologize, this is a little bit US centric, but uh, maybe it has broader applicability as well. Where have these supply chains gone wrong? What, what has been the problem? So let's quickly try and get a couple of people just to share what's going on here and then uh, we'll, we'll kind of take it from there. So can we get a couple of hand raises and move that along? Marianne Morris. One thing I noticed is that because a lot of businesses were closing, because a lot of businesses were closing, um, a, a lot of toilet paper that was ready to be distributed was not redirected to the stores because the links in the supply chain between um, grocery stores and businesses did not, and producers did not exist. Great, a perfect example. When you have a crisis, the supply chain gets extended. If you were in a just-in-time environment because you were focused on efficiency, all of a sudden, it doesn't work anymore. Great example. Someone else? Andrea Shorter. Say it again. Andrea Shorter? Uh-huh. Yeah. Yes. I think on the PPE, for one, as an example, um, there are a lot of sort of mid- to small business suppliers of large entities, of hospitals, clinics, et cetera. And so it seems as though that disruption was the demand. The demand was higher or perceived to be higher. And those supply um, chain agents have somewhat been displaced because of the global crisis and the disruption in the overall uh, supply chain. So the sources from which you would um, typically get those, that PPE, were kind of dead in the water. They weren't able to get the supplies that they would deliver. And um, also the change in policy of moving, um, you know, of, of who is manufacturing uh, supply, you know, the larger, you know, yep. companies and and so it's, it's been a mess, but that disruption of really sort of those middle to small business players is really significant. <laughs> Everyone then is going to um, a main source, China, for instance, and competing. Small cities, hospitals are competing with nations or their own state for that supply. Terrific, all right. So what was nice about our two comments is they dealt with the supply side and the demand side. The demand side, the spike was bigger than we've ever seen before. The supply side, whether it's the mid-sized providers who can't ramp up or it's the longer supply chains, doesn't matter. One other element, psychology, hoarding. We've seen hoarding in toilet paper, we've seen hoarding in PPE. So not only do you have to, in managing a supply chain, think about the raw underlying issues of supply and demand, but you need to think about the psychology as well. One last comment on the pork. Uh, the pork issue is not that there aren't pigs, not that there aren't uh, capabilities to, to feed them. Uh, the issue right now is that the design of that supply chain limits the size that those pigs can be when they get slaughtered. All the machines are designed for a 280 pound hog. And now that you have extended the supply chain and drawn it out, all of a sudden they're now 300 or 320 pounds. And we've got ourselves, oh my gosh, what do we do? Another, it's another example of that lack of resilience. In my time left, I wanna hit one other important item before I turn to you. Uh, and that is most of the discussion that we've had about supply chain failures focused from a consumer's perspective. Oh, I can't get toilet paper, I can't get PPE. There is also a supplier impact that's taking place. Think about Bangladesh. The vast majority of Bangladesh's income comes from being suppliers and soft goods. Those garment workers, 
not only are they facing the problems of being able, needing to stay at home, orders are being canceled. You can imagine the power differential between the brands and the suppliers is brands have a lot of power, suppliers not so much. Don't forget about the suppliers. There's two sides to every supply chain. I want to wrap up and talk about in the COVID world, there actually have been some very successful examples of supply chains. Uh, you may have heard that there's this concept of uh, convalescent plasma, where you can take the blood from a patient who tested positive for COVID, now tests negative, and you can extract their blood plasma and use that blood plasma in very ill patients. There's some evidence to say that that works, doesn't work perfectly, but it does work in some cases. This has never existed as a supply chain. And while I can't, don't have time to walk you through all the pieces of it, a supply chain to do this was built literally in a week. And it's got physical flows and it's got information flows and it's working. So even in the time of crisis, you can effectively respond. Let me wrap up with trying to suggest for you to do something once you hang up the phone or the computer. Take two minutes and in those two minutes, use what we've talked about in this hour to think about from your own perspective as a professional, how can you use these insights about supply chain management, these best practices, and also think about it from a personal perspective. Is there some ideas or insights in terms of supply chain concepts that you can use for your own personal development and life? So with that, I know we are right up against the time. Thank you again for being willing to invest an hour. I hope it was helpful. And uh, I'll turn it back to you, Erica. Great. Thank you so much, Professor Fagan. And thank you to all who joined us today or are watching this later. The recording link will be sent to you in the next day or so. For those of you who are joining us live, you will receive a link for a survey when you leave the session. Please take a moment to share your feedback with us. And we hope you will join us for other webcasts in our alumni series each Wednesday, including next week's session on managing COVID-19 in the Americas, Africa, and the Middle East, hosted by Ricardo Hausman. We posted some registration links for you in the chat. We hope to see you then. Thank you and be well.